There are certain ideas, certain technological aspirations, certain dreams that the human race has had time and time again. And when you go back in ancient history, there are certain desires, certain inventions, certain capabilities that man, humankind, has always wanted to acquire. Now, as technology has progressed, some of these ideas reappear as companies, as writings, as stories, as aspirations that we want to fulfill one day. Along the way, sometimes we try to achieve these ideas, to turn them into reality, and we fail. But yet, some number of years down the road, some number of decades, or maybe even centuries, we try again. These ideas that keep appearing in history over and over as deep desires of the human race, I refer to as resonant ideas. Now, there are many technologies that are being pursued today that fall into the category of these resonant ideas. There are many technology pundits, many technologists, business people, venture capitalists that look to predict the future of these technologies and are very quick to dismiss certain ideas as either having worked or having failed. But my view is that looking at technologies with this lens of what falls into the bucket of a resonant idea gives a good sense of what humankind will keep aspiring to until these goals are achieved. So today I want to talk about a couple of such ideas, a couple of such technologies that are being pursued actively, even today, which may have had some modicum of success already, may have challenges, but the reason why I remain optimistic about these ideas is again, these are ancient aspirations that one day will come true and we'll keep trying until we get there. So one example is the flying carpet. Now you go back and you look at ancient fables. You look at the idea of Aladdin and his lamp and the magical flying carpet. What was that aspiration? The aspiration was for a rapid personal aerial transport. And through myth and history, you see lots of versions of this. We invented Pegasus as an example, a flying horse that could carry us wherever we wished. Uh, we invented flying dragons that would take us from one place to another speedily. So this aspiration of having a rapid personal flying transport that was, by the way, autonomous, because in all of these imaginings, whether with Pegasus or with uh, dragons or whether with the flying carpet, each one of them, importantly, had its own mind. So it wasn't just personal aerial transport, but it was personal aerial transport with autonomy. And again, in this century, in the last century, we've had lots of people, for example, a famous aircraft designer based in California by the name of Mahler, uh, who owned a company called Mahler Aviation, over the last many decades, trying to build a personal flying car, back to the Jetson cartoons, uh, again, a technological reimagination of the idea of a flying car. And to this day, there are a large number of companies that are trying to build um, aerial vehicular transport and also imbue these with autonomy. Now, we've had a lot of success recently and there are probably over a hundred companies today that are building you know, personal small aircraft, autonomous aircraft, UAS systems, uh, quote unquote, flying cars. The big issues that we have today are not technological, not that these can't fly, not that these can't fly safely, but we have issues around regulation. So where we are now with this particular resonant idea is not a technological barrier anymore, but a barrier of regulation, a barrier of law. And these barriers can sometimes be hard to overcome, but they will be overcome. And one of the reasons why is because there are many parts of the world now that are pursuing these technologies in parallel. Uh, these technologies are being pursued in China, in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere. And ultimately, the goal that these technologies have is a modicum, a level of efficiency, which is so great that if any one of these um, economies, any one of these countries acquires the technology, it'll very soon become a competitive issue and others will accelerate their regulation and catch up with implementing technology of this type. 
So one of the reasons why, whether in the near term or the medium term is kind of immaterial, but one of the reasons why I'm so positive and so bullish on aerial transport technology, autonomous aerial transport technology, is because, again, it's an idea that's lasted through centuries and keeps reinventing itself, and now we've overcome the technological hurdles and only have the regulatory hurdles to overcome. So I, I feel that this idea is one that's coming and it'll come soon. Another idea is the idea of digital money. I've written about this extensively, but over the last many, many decades, since networks came about, there's been this idea of why couldn't we have digital forms of payment and have a kind of e-money that would be used to very rapidly make payments with no middlemen, uh, with low transaction fees, and be able to accomplish everything we do with, let's say, the old wire system with banks, but do so very rapidly and very quickly. In fact, uh, Byte magazine, one of the seminal early publications uh, that focused on the computer revolution, a magazine that was started in the 70s and then uh, uh, closed circulation in the late 90s, uh, this magazine very famously covered the idea of e-money as one of its cover issues, uh, again, decades before Bitcoin happened or Ethereum happened. But yet, what, what seems to occur in digital money, again, is this reinvention every decade or so, this idea of an electronic form of payment, uh, perhaps a form of payment that has some uh, modicum of protection, secrecy, privacy, uh, and it remains to be seen how many of those features eventually manifest in a digital currency. But again, now we are at a point where even central banks have started to look at the idea of CBDCs or central bank digital currencies. Uh, there's an entire different group of people that believe that Bitcoin, uh, a system that is really managed by the crowd, is a more democratic, uh, decentralized system uh, that runs by algorithm rather than by fiat, that this is the right way forward. But again, no matter what the details, this digital form of payment is going to materialize. And it exists to some degree now, but a truly decentralized form of digital payment is probably around the corner and, and will happen. Now, the question, of course, is when that happens, what else happens? In the case of Bitcoin, what we've discovered is that th that infrastructure, the infra infrastructure of decentralized currencies, of decentralized tokens, brings with it uh, an entire stack of things like the blockchain, a decentralized database that runs by consensus and that can be used as the basis of a number of other innovations and a number of other applications and platforms and technologies. So as we fulfill these resonant ideas, generally we progress technology and we move it forward not just in the central pursuit of the core idea, for example, the flying carpet or digital money, but we also advance the groundwork, the underlying infrastructure, and that then enables a whole new slew of possibilities. So when you look at an idea and you want to evaluate whether or not it will work, perhaps you're evaluating the metaverse. Uh, perhaps you're evaluating you know, something new and different like quantum sensing, mind reading. A lot of these things, again, you'll find they are, they're captured in ancient history. The idea of the metaverse is the realm of dreams. The idea of mind reading, the idea of being able to uh, interpret a dream. Again, being able to figure out what images form in the brain and being able to actually see them and visualize them. All of these are technologies that are becoming real with machine learning, with fMRI, with numerous other uh, capabilities that are being developed now. So when you look to evaluate an idea, ask yourself, is this a resonant idea? Is this something that mankind has aspired to since millennia? Is this bound to happen?